Hey guys, what a wonderful time to be with you today. Um, I'm really enjoying. I've really enjoyed doing these over the past like 12, 13 years. First on YouTube, then um, a little bit before the pandemic, I started Facebook Live. And for a time, I did both, but I couldn't handle that um, full time. So what I do now is basically um, I record the video on Facebook and transfer it to YouTube. So, um, which is good because if Facebook is not working. I can go to YouTube, and if YouTube isn't working, I can go to Facebook. So it works, and it's a joy. Um, it really is. No matter how crappy my week is, I look forward to Sunday because I know I can express the word of, of God as he gave it to me. And this is a very interesting title that he gave to me. Um, I was... For, for those of you who don't know, I should explain a bit about my process when it comes to preaching. My process is a little weird. It's, it's very weird. Um, usually, preachers, you know, they get a word and speak they they get something and they spend hours and hours of study and study and study and it's like they spend hours coming up with sermon titles and study and study and study and study and study and, study. and like they look up scriptures and depending on the kind of preacher you are you may, may look up Greek and Hebrew words and write out your sermon and all that stuff and come up with handy dandy points. You know, not handy dandy points, but points that or phrases that that'll stick into somebody's mind and it's you know, depending on the kind of preacher you are. Um me the process is very different. Um, sermons come to me often when I'm just living my life. Um, I'm just watching something on YouTube or uh, Netflix or um, Prime or something. And it comes out of my natural uh, just relationship with God, my natural living with God, and I could I, I could get a sermon from from uh, novels. And they just come to me when I'm living my life because um, it's just like for me anything anything could spawn a sermon. I, I don't know when God's going to speak to me. And I don't even ask him to speak to me most times. I just live my life and uh, do what I'm going to do. I could be out and about at the doctor's office or the grocery store doing something. And he could, a thing might pop into my head. And what I do basically is ask him about it, and we we talk about it. I talk, he listens, he talks. I I listen. It's very strange our relationship. It's very kind of like I'm talking to a human, but nobody's there. Um, it's very kind of organic, and. I was, um, I was, it started off with, um, me, uh, 
watching Carl Lentz on a few things. And for those of you who know who don't know, Carl Lentz was the pastor of Hillsong, New York, until scandal hit where he was he had um he was unfaithful in his marriage and his wife to his wife and to his children because we know when you're unfaithful in the marriage you're not only unfaithful to your wife you're unfaithful to your family so things blew up he got fired and the whole media thing started um and at the time all i said was oh I, all, all i said was lord cover him and his family lord just be with him and his family and know and know that he will come back better and stronger and let him know that you still love him let him know that everything that he said is still true and minister to him in this moment and all of that stuff. And I, and I always wondered um, for these few years um, what happened to him. So I was on YouTube and I saw something with him and his wife. And it turns out now that they have a podcast called Lights On, um, where where this is like going into the, the fourth week where they explain uh, what happened to them. And they explain the ins and outs of what happened. Um, they don't tell the whole story, but neither do they need to. Um, but they explain it from their perspective, what God did in their marriage and uh, what they went through. And if you want, want to see that, it's on YouTube. Um, just just type in Carl Carl. Carl Lynn's Lights On. Lynn's, I think, is L-E-Z-S, I think. Um, Lights On. And you'll see it, and it's like three episodes, and uh, the the B-side productions uh, puts it up every every Wednesday night. So anyway, they're going through their story and all that stuff. Um, and then I flipped over. I was watching um, the 7M TikTok documentary on Netflix about this dance crew that was created by a pastor uh, who manipulated these children into um, into uh, this kind of um, cult thing and ended up taking all that manipulating them and keeping them away from their families and all of this stuff. And that is on Netflix. It's called uh, 7M, the TikTok. I, I don't know what it's called. The TikTok dance something. You'll find it. Just type in 7, 7M on Netflix. You'll find it. It's it's a really well put together documentary. And then I flipped over to uh, the Ashley Madison documentary. Now, I haven't finished that one yet. And um, 
But what that one is about so far that I see is Ashley Madison was a site in the early 2000s um, that um, was basically a site for married people who wanted to have affairs. And it was also in, encouraging married people to cheat. So thinking about, first of all, I'm wondering how how depraved do I have to be watching this? Uh, maybe I shouldn't be preaching and all that stuff. And But the Lord said to me in watching this, he said, look closer. Look closer. What do all these things have in common? So I thought about Carl Lynn's. I thought about uh, 7M. I thought about Ashley Madison. And I said, what are you trying to show me here, God? Um, He said, I want you to talk about the culture of shame. And I, he said, I said, culture of shame. Um, he said, yeah, um, we've, we've made shame cool. We've made, we've made shame kind of a thing. We call it, uh, slut shaming for people who, um, sleep around and for whatever we we do body shaming and we just like there's all this shame this and shame that he he's like we've we've given it a name and we've kind of in a way we've shunned it but then we've celebrated it Um, we've given it a label, but in a way we're not, we're saying don't do that, but we're talking out of two, two sides of our mouths. On one side, we're saying don't do that, and on one side we're saying do it. Um, and I'm coming after shame today. And this sermon is called, It's a Garden Thing. Um, When I look at Adam and Eve in the garden, that's where shame started. Because um, the devil, the serpent, the evil one, lied to Eve. He... He preyed on her vulnerabilities and lied to her. And when she took a bite of the fruit, shame and all the sin came into the world. And and even when Jesus died for our sins to take it away, um, He died for our sin, for our shame, but the problem is we're not receiving it. And sometimes, sometimes something could be there, but if you don't receive it and open it and use it, what good is it? What good is it? It's like if I got something from Amazon. Um, let's say I ordered, um, a hat from Amazon, and I'm like, oh my god, I really want a hat. So, so Amazon delivered it to my door, and I got one of the, one of the people that I work with to bring it in, and to, to put it on my table, and... But I didn't open it, and it's 
and it and it was there for a week or two weeks or whatever. It's not any good unless I open it. So, so the the gift that Jesus died for are no good unless we open them and use them. And the devil would love to keep us in shame and in guilt. And he, he would love to keep us going with this presentation without getting to the real crux of real healing. The problem I see with traditional church is, when I say traditional church, I mean uh, going to church, singing the two songs and whatever. Uh, With that, the problem with that is there, there is very little real healing going on. Very little real restoration going on. Yes, the word hits and it helps and restores some people. But I think the Lord wants us to do so much more. I think he's calling us to a higher level, just away with the presentation and away with the foolishness and away with the with the gimmicks and all that stuff and just give people the word of the word of God and create um and create a place where can, people can be open with their sh- with their uh, shame and with their with their stuff. And because I think I think back to the to those early, early days with um, Pastor Carl and all that. Um, and I and I was saying, what if he there there was no such thing as shame or whatever, and he could just um, come to his to his congregation and say, look, guys, I'm struggling. Um, I think like if he can say. If he can be vulnerable enough to to stand in a group and say, "I'm struggling with with sex," or or I'm struggling with addiction to pills, or I need help, and without and instead of shame, get love and get care and get all of those things like how much better would it would it have been and if those kids from 7m instead of getting hooked up with that creep of a pastor could have said you don't want to be honest and be vulnerable and said you know what i need something I want something. I think churches become a show and not not like like and I think that people are looking for something real and something authentic. We're saying we're real and we're saying we're authentic, but I think we need to be create create a space where we can be vulnerable with each other, where we can just learn from each other and stuff. I see I see a place where instead of um, there's one person leading, 
I see a place of sharing and a place of real healing and a place of, like, just, I'm with you, just a place of real restoration. And I think, and if those couples and Ashley Madison could have been real and said, you know what? I'm looking for more sexually in my marriage or something is broken in me that I want to go outside my marriage before they did, you know, without shame, without, without all that. I think it would be so much better and I think because we know that there are no, there's no condemnation in Christ. But the reality is sometimes there's condemn, condemnation with other Christians. <laughs> there's no condemnation in Christ, but there's condemnation with other Christians. And it's very scary to be vulnerable with other Christians because People don't want the judgment. People don't want the judgment. And I think we need to change the way we actually do church. Get rid of the prettiness. Get rid of the, you know, of the whole show and presentation. Because people are dying. People are literally dying they're struggling with different things. They're dealing with different things. And if the church is not the answer, what is? If Jesus is not the answer for any for everything that anyone could possibly be dealing with, what is? It's time to get rid of all the stuff and go to God and say, Lord, how do you want us to structure the church? How can we best help people? What do you want us to do to tackle all this stuff? Like, it, it's great to talk about Ma Matthew, uh, Mark, and Paul, and all of that. But the thing I liked about Jesus is he tackled the issues of his day. He didn't say, oh, let's go to the Torah and find this or the Pentateuch. He just looked around and tackled the issues of his day in a way that people could understand it. And I think we're so busy looking for catchphrases or looking for a sermon that we don't look around. We, we, we try and find the sermon and relate it to what's going on today, but we're not, we don't, we don't need another pretty catchphrase or whatever. We don't need another Bible study. People are dying. They need the truth. That's what they need. They don't need another pretty sermon title or they don't need another, you know, whatever. They need the truth. They need Jesus. They need to say, I'm, they need the freedom to say, I'm gay and I don't know what to do about it. Or they need the freedom to say, I'm struggling with sex and I don't know what to do with, about it. Or I think I'm going to kill my husband, or I think I'm going to kill myself, or whatever they're dealing with. They need the freedom to say that, and they need the freedom to, to ask, what do I do about that? And they don't need pretty scriptures or pretty words or whatever. They need, brother, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. We'll figure this out together. We'll, we'll ride through this together. That's what they need. The world is crying out for the real Jesus. And we have the answer to it. And the answers are not 
in uh, pretty worship songs or whatever. They need the truth. They need the gospel. Not the not just the good news, which is gospel is good news, but they need Jesus. They need to know that they could come to Jesus and say, I I just can't deal with this anymore. I am about to lose my mind. I'm about to lose my marriage. I'm about to take some pills and off myself. Or they, they need the freedom to say that without judgment, without fear, without all that. Because you know what Jesus did? He tackled the issues of his day. And it was, it's so funny. You know what the Lord told me? He said, don't focus so much on what I did. Focus on how I did it. And I said, wow. I said, because... Because not that the Bible isn't relevant, it is. But, like, it's how did he do things? How did he run his ministry? How did he do that? that, He was so approachable when he was on earth. He was so non-judgmental. He told people the truth but in a way that they were just so enamored by him because nobody had told him truth like that anymore. Nobody had told them truth like that. And that's why people loved him and the religious people didn't like him at all. And, oh, my God, it's so wonderful when I think about it. But people need the real Jesus. People need to know that that Jesus is not going to like beat you up or put, or bash you over the head or whatever. He's he's going to love you. He yes, he's going to correct you. But what is love without correction? You can't have a child that you love and don't tell them no when they're doing something that you don't think is wrong. And when he does does correct you, he does it in such a loving way. And I know people have abused the Bible and did all this kind of crazy stuff, but that's people. That's not God. Yes, God uses people, um, but sometimes... People use God to. People have used God's for God for their own agendas and their own strange uh, ways and whatever. And the world needs the real Jesus, and the world needs to know that they can be honest with Jesus. Uh, Jesus is not so, someone that you have to dress up for. You can say it's it's me, and wh- what you can say it's me, and here's what I'm dealing with. Um, I think that um, when it goes back to Eve in the garden, she 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 um after she at the fruit, she hid because of shame. And she hid with her husband. And when the Lord said, Adam, where are you? They hid. They hid what was wrong with them instead of coming to God and saying, we did this. They they hid and st- they they blamed each other and started to hide. So I just w- want to tell you that 
all this blaming and shaming people. Just because you give it a label doesn't mean it's less harmful. Like fat, fat shaming and slut shaming and all that. Um, just because you give it a cute name like that doesn't mean it's less harmful. And the Lord said today, away with shame, away with shame. So you're dealing with something. We all are. The thing to do is come to God. The thing to do is come to the Lord and and be real about it. Be real about whatever you're going to. And he'll send the proper resources, and the proper people into your life to help you deal with whatever. You just have to get the courage to be honest. And beloved, I know it's hard. I know it's not easy. But he loves you so much. I just want to tell you, he loves you so much. And he doesn't condemn you. He wants to redeem you. He doesn't condemn you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to make you brand new. Away with shame. It's a garden thing. And you know what? Jesus died for all those garden things. And... And I want to say now that shame is of the devil. And anyone dealing with shame right now, everyone dealing with guilt right now, it's under your feet if you put it at the cross of Jesus. And I know it's hard. And I know it's just, You just feel so broken. But the Lord's main thing is to heal, restore, deliver. The main purpose of the cross is to get rid of shame, get rid of guilt, get rid of all those negative emotions. And to know you can be covered, you can be restored. And to be covered is not to excuse. To be covered is saying, although you did a crappy thing, I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to love you out of it. And he wants to love you out of it so much today. He wants you to know that you are loved, that you are cherished, that you are forgiven. And all those garden things that started in the garden, sin and shame didn't start with you. It started in the garden. And the the ability that, that people, not the ability, the, the, The thing about people using God for their own gain was not about him too. It's about it's about them preying on people's emotions. And he wants me to say, I'm sorry for any pastor, any leader that preyed on your emotions and got you to do things that that uh, we're, we're not right. And those people were not people of God. Pe- those people were people that have used manipulation and people's insecurities to prey on them, to, to tell them lies, to, to just, um, to just be a conduit for the devil to use them. The Lord doesn't shame you. He wants to restore you. People may fat shame you. People may 
slut shame you, people may body shame you or anything. But the Lord wants wants to restore you. And I'm sorry for all the people that mistreated you, all the people that told you that you were no good because of what you did. What you what you did is what you did and God will work that out in time or whatever and make you into the person that he wants you to be. But he's really focused on who you are. If you just come to the Christ with honesty and say, Lord, I am a mess and just just tell him everything that's in your that's in your heart everything that's in your spirit he'll take that thing and through a process he'll restore you he'll take back every everything that has hurt you and has shamed you and it will be a process it won't be easy but you'll have a partner that will go with you in the shame, that will be in the muck and the mire with you. And he's into healing you and restoring you because he loves you that much. And he wants you to know that shame is not a new thing. Shaming is not like a current thing. Uh... Shaming is a garden thing. And for everything that happened in the garden, Jesus died for. When he died on the cross, the last thing he said when he died on the cross, he, he said, it is finished. So that term, it is finished, meant all the shame all the guilt, all the condemnation. It is done in Christ. You are not condemned. You are not guilty. You are not shameful. All that was dealt with in Christ, and you just need to, he's given you the gift, but all you need to do, as I said earlier, is open the gift up and use it because sometimes when we accept the lord into our into our lives we say salvation or having the lord lord come into our lives and make it new is a free gift and it is but a gift is nothing unless you open up the box and use it a lot of people have the gift of salvation and everything that that gift entails. But they've never opened up the box and used what's in there. The Lord today wants you to open up his free gift and use what's in there. And the good thing about it is... You don't need to buy refills. He just refills it automatically. You know, for some things, you have to buy refills. You buy, like, a water filter, or you buy um, something like that, and you have to keep refilling it. With, With all the gifts that God has given you, along with salvation... He, ref- he refills it automatically. He says his mercy is new every morning. His, his love is new every morning. His peace is new every morning. And all the gifts that come with salvation are new, are new every morning. And, and all, and, and all that shame and all that guilt is a garden thing. He doesn't want you to carry it anymore. 
He wants you to be restored, delivered, and healed. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye. And remember, don't let that garden thing of shame, guilt, and condemnation be your thing. Lay it down at the feet of Jesus, and and he'll take care of it. And he'll take care of you because he loves you that much. Bye. I'm training my sorrows, I'm training my pain, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord, I'm training my sickness, I'm training my pain, I'm laying them down. For the joy of the Lord. And sickness can mean soul sickness. It can be in your mind, will, and emotions. It can be spiritual sickness in your spirit. Or it can be physical sickness in your body. And we sing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. So, yes, Lord, means you're saying yes to him taking that, that shame, that guilt, that pain, that condemnation. You're saying, yes, I'm trading it. I'm I'm giving it over to you for you to restore me. And amen basically means it is so. You come into agreement with God that, that you're allowing him to take your sorrow. You're allowing him to take your shame. You're, allow, you're allowing him to take all those garden things. And know, to know that those garden things that that Eve dealt with in the garden and that Adam dealt with in the garden and all those garden things that we deal with today, Jesus came for them all. Jesus didn't only come for you to go to heaven. Jesus came to deal with all those garden things. Jesus came and shed his blood to die for all those garden things. To die for everything that you would do. Things that you haven't even thought of doing yet, but will do in the future. Things that you are doing now. The Lord cover you in your guilt and your shame and give you the courage to to do what you need to do and get the restorative help that that he sent into your life whether that be counseling or prayer or whatever help that he sent into your life He just wants you to know that he loves you. And there's nothing that you could ever do to make him stop loving you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more or to make him love you less. He just loves you greater than anything that that you can ever dream of. And he's holding you now. And he's loving you now. And his grace covers you and restores you and heals you. 
Thank you, Lord. Okay, guys, I'll see you later. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Yes, yes, Lord, amen. Yes, yes, Lord, amen. Yes, yes, Lord, amen. I'll see you next week, guys. Take care. Bye.